Hey, guys, we have a guest coming up. Tonight's guest has the number one podcast in the country right now. And even if you didn't live in Georgia back in 2002, you still may have heard of the tri-state crematory scandal. Journalist Sean Revive took a deep dive and came up with uh, an absolutely riveting true crime podcast that reveals far more than anyone expected. It's called Noble, and I believe all of us are currently enjoying it. I know Steph turned everybody on to it, uh, and uh, he'll be coming up uh, very shortly. We're Generation X. Laughing at the world today We're getting older But we're still Gonna play Well, what's going on in the country this week? We talked about it a couple weeks ago. The, uh, the We talked a little bit about the Republican National Convention. Uh, the DNC, the Democratic National Convention, is going on right now, but I'm not watching any of it. Um, I'm just watching all the clips because I have to for work. But uh, the one thing I saw politically this week, which was very weird and, and surreal for me to watch, was I watched the 45-minute interview that Theo Vaughn did on this past weekend with Donald Trump, and I watched the one he did with Bernie Sanders. I guess it was last week. You but do a it, lot of cocaine, eh? You like the cocaine? Is 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 it an up? Is it an up? And Theo goes, oh, yeah, man, that'll turn you into an owl on your porch, man. You become your own lamppost when you're doing that. And Trump doesn't understand that, that humor. He's just looking at him like, did you ever see when Ali G interviewed Trump on the original run yeah. of the Ali G yeah. show? <laughs> yeah. And Trump was like, okay, let's just, let's get, because he doesn't suffer that kind of nonsense. But he did with Theo. I thought it was very interesting. And, and it's as polarizing as you could imagine, you know, with his, his fan base. But, you know, um, it was weird to see Trump just sitting there and not getting frustrated and answering his questions. Of course, he did his, well, we built the wall and blah, 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 and we won the election and all that stuff. But he was very humanizing. And I think that's kind of odd because he doesn't normally do those kind of interviews. And I think he kind of has to. He started off with Will Bear and says, uh, you're one of the big ones. So that's why I'm here because he had no idea. He met Theo earlier this year at a UFC fight. Yeah, and so they had that to talk about as well for... A right, while, UFC, but, but yeah, I imagine that that was what Trump talking to Barron is like. <laughs> I was school, uh, great. I heard it was a great school. <laughs> uh, Theo Vaughn asked him, uh, "Where'd you get a school?" And he's like, uh, "Wharton, Wharton. Uh, it's in Philadelphia." And Theo goes, "Oh yeah, Rocky." <laughs> <laughs> he goes, "He goes. I think we ate there one time nearby. We ate there. We ate by there one time, man." Uh, uh, and he kept calling him Donald. Do you really think Barron's cool enough to listen to Theo Vaughn? I think Barron, we don't know anything about him. He could be the coolest kid on earth and he could probably go, my dad's a dick. Who knows what he thinks? Here's a couple of things they found on Reddit. Um, Biden or Trump said, uh, remember, Biden said only God can get me to quit this race. And Theo goes, well, somebody dressed up like God and chased him out of there. <laughs> oh, yeah. And Theo goes, uh, he was, uh, Trump's like, well, what do you do when you're when you're on cocaine? He goes, I go go karting with hookers. <laughs> <laughs> did he ask so Trump that, what he what he did when he was on cocaine? Well, I've never done it, but I imagine yeah, Trump I never drank or done. Anything. I never did drugs because, you know, my brother Fred, he was always drinking scotch and drunk all the time, you know. But he's he's really now he's he's up here a little bit higher and his uh, voice is a little raspier and he's uh, got the, you know because he's got the uh, veneers of the teeth and so he's doing a little bit of that stuff and that got really uh you know, you know it got picked up on the Zoom call that I did with Elon Musk. But I thought we'd ask George W. Bush what he's what he's doing with the uh, RNC and, you know, give us a recap. But I asked him, you want to hear what he had to say? Absolutely. I really would love to see what his thoughts are of the party currently. Well, I watched Hillary Clinton last night. Uh, I thought she did a well, it was two nights ago, I guess. She did a fantastic job last night. My good friend uh, Michelle Obama spoke and uh, my other good friend uh, Barack Obama spoke. Uh, I really, I just had it on as background noise. Uh, I was, you know, scrolling through TikTok and Instagram reels and Facebook. I'm thinking about starting a, uh, a page for my paintings and art. It's pretty good. Uh, what do you, what do you look at on TikTok? 
on TikTok, I like to follow, you know, those videos that have, uh, you know, people getting fights into fights in like Waffle House or like uh, bum fights. Well, like not world, bum fights. World star? <laughs> well, it's sort of like World Star, but it could be anybody. I mean, these people, they get they, they go into restaurants and they fight because they didn't get ketchup. Uh <laughs> I like to watch, you know, the, the, you know, the people fighting in the street or, or, you know, those guys who do that, you know, what do they call that when they do the donuts in the middle of the highway and hold everybody up? That's fun. I was street racing, the takeovers. Racing. Yeah. That kind of stuff is fun. I, I also like cats and dogs and animal TikToks. You know, I, 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 one thing I really enjoy, you ever seen magnet fishing? <laughs> it's like these yeah, young guys, I have. they buy these giant magnets and they get like a bungee cord and they throw the magnet into a river or a creek or a pond or something, and they pull up black like, bicycles and old cash registers, and sometimes they find a gun and they have to call the police. That sounds like fun and very relaxing. Cause, uh... and then other times I, you know, I'll, I'll watch those guys who, you know, walk through creeks with uh, the metal detectors. That's pretty fun. You know, my old man and I used to have a metal detector club. We wouldn't let Jeb get involved in it though, cause uh, you know he was a dork. <laughs> what's the what's the weirdest thing you ever found with the metal detector the weirdest thing i ever found was a box and uh, i thought it was like a cash box or something but you know whatever we found we got to keep and i thought it might be cool maybe there's old civil war gold in here and I, but i opened it up and it was just a bunch of old vibrators but the batteries had uh you know how if you leave batteries in something for a long time you know the ash it leaks out so not only were the batteries no good but the uh, the vibrators were no good so i just put them in the dump I mean, I got him out of the got him out of the ground. Who do you think's going to win? Who do I think's going to win? Uh, well, somebody's going to win, and I, I guarantee it won't be the American people. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm done doing this voice. I'll talk to you guys later. <laughs> Adios. Bye. Thanks, George. Bye, bye, George. I like George Bush. I I I got no issues with him. You asked me what I thought of him 22 years ago, and you would get a different answer. <laughs> So we should talk about this spaceship. Steph sent me this story. I haven't been paying much attention to it, but the Boeing Starliner, which was supposed to go into space for, what, a couple days, orbit the Earth and come back down. But like everything else Boeing produces, um, it fucking doesn't work. And it's stuck on the International Space Station and they can't fix it. Uh, it's going to take months. These people are, you know, bored out of their minds. They have to share whatever the space food is. They're uh, they're crammed good. into that place. There's not like not even enough places for them to sleep. No. And imagine they got to poop and pee and uh, do all that stuff. It must stink. It must <laughs> absolutely reek in that thing. Just open the window every now and then. Let the yeah, air just air it out a little bit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> to let the galaxy in. You know, there are other companies that could go up and get them or help them. I was saying the other day that they should take the uh, the old space shuttles out of mothballs and send that shit up there. But yeah, why not? Worry about that blowing up. Well, the shuttles you don't have a problem with. It's the boosters that were the problem. Yeah, that's true. The shuttles were always fine, except for the one that blew up during reentry. And that was because of the tiles. Yeah, Columbia. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But, you know, and you know, it's too soon. I don't want to. I'm not making fun of the space shuttles. But the this Boeing thing is just, it, it's not on the news. You have to find it in like page six, or sometimes it'll show up in your algorithm. But these people are stuck up there. And uh, they're not going to let Elon Musk go up there and get him with uh, what's his called the uh, the Musk missile. <laughs> you know, these people might not even come back until maybe February. Yeah, they're not going to be back for a long time if they if they come back at all. Maybe 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 Taylor Taylor said Taylor, Taylor Swift would go up uh, in my rocket and uh, we could we could bring those uh, Starliner people back. That would be kind of cool. Uh, so 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 we thought that. Um, you and asked what my favorite um, Lost in Space movie is, and uh, it's a movie about that uh, Tesla with the the spacesuit in it that's just out in space. That's pretty good. You ever see that? <laughs> no, my favorite uh, Lost in Space television show or movie is Star Trek Voyager, and uh, to me, that's really the last of the original type of writing Star Trek show, and uh, it was just an excuse to... You know, do another Star Trek show, but they got lost in the Delta Quadrant, and they had to try to find their way home, and that left uh, that led to a, what seven seasons of, or was it was it shorter than that? But anyway, that's one of my favorites. Jeff, do you have one? I picked The Martian. Oh, The Martian, yeah, with the yeah. uh, what's his face, Matt Damon. That, that's a fun little romp. Yeah, if you like potatoes. <laughs> yep. Yeah, and the book was great too. Uh, I like Event Horizon. Oh yeah, yeah. Event Horizon, good movie. 
It's scary. Is that Sam Elliott? No, not Sam Elliott. Sam Neill. Sam Neill, yeah. And yeah. Larry Fishburne. Yeah, The Shining in Space. Yeah, basically. It, but scary, the, it was scary as fuck. It's scary. Yeah, and The Littlest Jovi. Mm-hmm. John Bon Jovi's brother, that half brother, that kind of acted for a couple of years. The one that get the one that went into the dark side and came back. Little bear. They called him Little Bear. Little bear. His mama bear yeah. and Little Bear. Baby yeah, Bear. He pop. was in a few movies in the in the late nineties, early aughts. Yeah, and then Matt, just never nothing. Did. Oh, he doesn't act anymore. Okay. See, <laughs> mine was um the two thousand nine movie Pandorum. What's that about? Um it's a it starts off it was about a group of humans that are going to another planet uh to Mm -hmm. recolonize um but you start the movie with one guy waking up and realizing that the ship is pretty much empty a lot of people are dead and there are these creatures running around the ship and they're trying to you know figure out what's what's happening and they can't locate where they are in space dennis quaid he is uh billed as one of the main actors in it, but it's only like he's the captain in flashback. So he had okay. like six scenes and then that was it. He was out. Norman Reedus is also in Pandorum. Yeah. That was, I think that was his first big movie after Boondock Saints. Boondock Saints. Yeah. Oh, cool. Cool. Everywhere you look, there was just bodies. Just human bodies. In the winter of 2002, the most mind-blowing crime you've never heard of happened in the least likely of places. We all know the story. Well-respected people in a small community, and boy, that, that's a real small community. More than 300 human bodies were found in a tiny town called Noble. I mean, guys, this looked like a horror movie. I was like, my God, there's skeletons everywhere. There was just this sickening odor. This was just overwhelming. All right, coming up on Radio Labyrinth right now, Sean Revive, a freelance print and audio journalist based in Atlanta. He's written for Wired, The Intercept, BuzzFeed, The Ringer, Smithsonian, Deadspin, Atlas Obscura, The Atlantic, and The Washington Post, and probably a lot more. You can find him at SeanRevive.com. It's S-H-A-U-N, Revive.com. Sean, welcome to Radio Labyrinth, and thank you. Thanks for having me. What a uh, what a podcast, man! It is uh, the number one podcast in the country. It's and we were just talking about it before you joined that it was just the biggest story, and then it just kind of went away. And now we're all re, re being reminded of it and reliving it. And uh, I'm glad that you brought it to our ears. So thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. It's it was an unbelievable story, one that I only vaguely remembered uh, when it happened. Um, probably distracted by nine eleven, like you said. Um, but once I sort of reread about it when I moved to Georgia, I just was blown away by it. So you didn't live here whenever this happened? No, I was I was living in New York at the time. Steph is uh, is the person who reached out and, and asked you to come on the show, and she got us all into the show, um, <laughs> our resident true crime podcast listener. And from the minute I started listening to this, the very minute I turned it on, it was just the music, the the production, the way it's presented, and the storytelling. So it's just it's that kind of thing that that just gets into your ears, and uh, you just gotta. I'm glad I'm not binging it. I like waiting. I'm like, oh, I got that one. Yeah, you have to wait for the next few weeks, uh, sort of one week at a time. Some of my friends have said, you know, release the episodes, but uh, out of my. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and you were describing, you know, um, all the different aspects of it that you were enjoying, and uh, I just want to make really clear that it was, it's not like just me making it by myself. I've had like. A, amazing team of people working on it including my producer johnny kaufman and incredible composer um garrett tiedemann it was just like so many people contributing so much um and i really think the music turned out pretty incredible too oh the music drives it a hundred percent it builds the dread um you know make you're welling up with emotion whenever you're narrating and stuff i mean the music is great and waveland they're really coming up it seems like as far as like, I actually heard about this because they were advertising it on th- that other podcast, uh, three, about those two girls that killed their best friend. And uh, that was really well done. So I've, I've been interested in any kind of Waveland um, pockets. How did you hook up with them? 
Um, so I I sort of uh, heard about them through Campside, which is the, another company that um, uh, hired me to do the podcast. Um, and they work we're, they're working with Waveland on this one. And I think Waveland works with a bunch of different uh, independent uh, journalists and production companies uh, to make the podcast. But yeah, they've all been I think really well received. They've all been hits. Um, they're all really good. They're yeah, they're they're a great podcasting company. What's the timeline on coming up with a podcast like this? I mean, you, I mean, when did you start? this podcast i first read about the case around 2015 or 2016 i can't remember the exact date i sort of put it on my list of you know 100 ideas that to come back to someday um it, it seemed like too um too hard of a thing to do i was just beginning as a journalist and i didn't know georgia very well at all i just moved moved here um and then a couple of years ago in 2022 i was just trying to think of something to do uh uh, COVID had really like hurt my ability to get gigs, to do the kind of reporting that I like doing, traveling. I've got a young kid. Um, I just couldn't really go very far. I didn't want to go very far. Um, I was speaking to another journalist, a friend named uh, Max Blau, who's an incredible Georgia journalist. Um, and he he's like, what about Tri-State? Um, you know, he looked at it, every journalist, uh, every long form journalist, I think in, in Georgia had looked at it. Um, and he's like, why don't you give it a shot? You have time. You're not really doing much. Um, and uh, I made a couple calls, uh, including to McCracken Poston, the lawyer, and uh, they went really well. I, I got some documents and I'm like, let's try it. And that, were you thinking about it as, as a podcast or were you thinking about it as a book at that time? I was thinking about it as a podcast the whole time. Um, it's a little hard for me to remember why. I think because I I just done a podcast, and it, it was really fun. I enjoyed it. It was my, my first time doing one, and I thought let's let's try it again. But it also, I, I also felt like the people that I'd spoken to had really cool voices. Um, they sounded yeah, they do. Fun. Um, and then it just got better and better. The more people I met, um, the more people it just it just just seemed like an audio thing. If you were going to describe this podcast to somebody that doesn't know about the scandal, uh, what would you say to them? Well, I would say it's it's about uh, a rural property in northwest Georgia where they found 300 bodies. The podcast is sort of exploring how this could happen, why it happened, and at the same time, uh, musing on why this kind of thing is so important to people, why, why people care so much about people after they die, their bodies. And what happened with this case that we're not going to say now because we want everybody to continue listening. And I don't there's things I don't remember and I don't want spoiled either. So um I, I can't wait till next uh, next Wednesday because I've already listened to episode five. But um, the laws that were changed, the uh, the things that you don't even think of, you don't think of these things until you're faced with it, really. And when you have a loved one who passes away and what, you know, according to their wishes, are you going to bury them or are you going to cremate them? Um, they're just things you don't think about. Also, when you're told a story like this, when you first heard it on the news, you were absolutely horrified. To think that there's this property where work is supposed to be done to cremate bodies and they're just putting them in the back or wherever they were putting them and and however many bodies they were it was just this horrific thing. And and it, the, this, the way the podcasts go in, in order, you know, it it talks about, you know, the 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 horror that that these families and just because it's dead bodies and they're dead people, we and their, their spirits are gone and everything. And I'm getting to a point here, sorry. <laughs> but just, just you don't think about those things. You know, the, the horror that if, if my my mom died in 96 and if I found out that her ashes weren't really hers, I would go dig them up and find out where they really went, you know? So it's very personal and it touches everybody because everybody dies. And so. And I'm the exact opposite. I don't find, I've never felt like it was very precious. Like after you're dead, I've told my husband, throw me in a bag, throw me in a dumpster, okay. go on to work. I don't care. <laughs> But when you hear the families, their perspective on right. this was their family members wishes and they didn't get to fulfill them. So that aspect of it, it just really um, it really puts it in perspective for you. Yeah, I, I, I loved all the different perspectives we heard, um, not just from the families, but all the, also the investigators, um, legal people. Um, the, everyone had a different perspective on death. Some people, you know, I guess were more like Stephanie, where they don't really care what happens to them or their loved ones just because once they're gone, they think they're gone. Um, and, but some people, it was, it's just this incredibly sacred thing that you can understand both. You can understand both perspectives pretty easily because um, everybody's experienced, I think a little bit of both. Um, and that was another thing that really drew me to the story. I, I love 
complexities. And this story was incredibly complex. The, the feelings people had about what happened to them range, you know, from zero to 10. And like, you know, two people had the same reaction. And a lot of people's reactions changed over the past 22 years. So capturing the way they felt um, in 2002 uh, could be difficult, but it was also fun for them to look back, I think, and fun for us to like get them to look back at this time that could have been very hard for them. Did, did you have a hard time tracking down any of these people 20 some years later? Yeah, def- definitely. Um, luckily, most of them lived within like a certain uh, radius of each other. Um, but, you know, some people, you know, aren't easy to find just in general. Um some people didn't want to speak for sure, particularly like uh, funeral home directors who were involved in the case and, and the, uh, cla- and the uh, lawsuits and stuff like that. Um, uh, and, you know, a lot of individuals are just kind of off the map and sometimes we have to knock on doors to find them. Yeah, hey, that's what I wanted to ask you about the funeral homes. Um, you know, you, you remark on how uh, the marshes charged an unusually low rate to cremate, like way more than they way less than hardly anybody else, really. And do you think, like, they were uh, the funeral homes, Timu? Like, they knew something must be wrong. Like, when you order anyway? something from Timu, and it's like $4, <laughs> and you know what you get it anyway. So I think it's possible. I, I, I don't have proof either way. Um, probably. But, you know, I was I was fooled by Mark McGuire and Sammy Sosa. Um, mm-hmm. I was... I was sort of just like looking at the shine of all the home runs. And I think the same thing could happen when you have a good deal on a cremation. If you could make a little bit more money by, you know, by uh, downselling that part of it and getting more profit from your clients, you know? Um, But yeah, I don't know. Probably. Yeah, probably. Even even at that low, those low rates, they could have paid to fix the equipment, right? Uh, Out of those 300 payments that they got for the bodies. More than 300, you know, <laughs> more like a thousand over that period. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's expensive to fix those things. It's not easy if you're busy, you know, a um, little unclear. Yeah, the uh, the funeral director from, was it from Tennessee, who uh, who was on episode, was it four or was it three? I, I can't remember. The guy who was specialized in cremation, yeah, Chuck. Yes, he did a very good job of detailing how intricate the machines are and how every piece is important and if one thing doesn't work you have to replace it and you have to be very meticulous with with doing that and something i'd never even thought of i thought you just put the bodies in and burned them and, he was incredible um, he invited us to his uh, funeral home and showed us his um a crematory um there was actually a body in there at the time being burned it takes several hours and um, he didn't show it to us but he showed us the machine pointed to the buttons and stuff like that, uh, showed us how a um, embalming works because he does that too. Um, he showed us a, a bucket of um, artificial limbs and stuff like that. You know, every, he burns a lot of bodies and, and when they have artificial limbs, they come out of the, uh, of the, uh, of the furnace and he's got just like a bucket of them, which he fills up, I, I think every week or every month, uh, you know, fake eyes, fake, fake arms, that kind of stuff. Um, he was just such a cool guy and so smart, had been in the business for so long, had a great perspective on it course i have a million questions but um what are some of your favorite podcasts um a friend i think perfectly described uh, my favorite podcast it, it's definitely s town that was like one of the, maybe the maybe the first true crime one i ever heard and i don't think anything's ever topped it since um i, I met a friend descri- uh, a really good friend of mine described it as the citizen Kane of podcasts and i think that i would <laughs> say the same um i gotta admit that i'm not like super seasoned in true crime podcasts, I've listened to probably less than a dozen. Um, wow. And nowadays, I'm a little afraid. I, I, when I was making, when writing this one particular, I was a little bit afraid to listen to too many and uh, copy things. So I just didn't listen to any while I was making them. Um, this make you want to do another one? Yeah, I, I definitely want to make more podcasts, um, whether they're crime related or not. Um, at the moment, I don't have I don't have the next one coming up. Do you have a good delivery and you have a good presentation? Because this type of storytelling that that you're doing doesn't exist in my medium, Oregon Radio. I don't hear a lot of that. Maybe on NPR a little bit, but not this in depth. And it certainly doesn't exist on broadcast television. And that's because there's just so much. There's there's cable. There's streaming. And so podcasting allows this kind of story to be told in a serialized fashion. And you know, it, it's informative, paced well. Um, and it feels like this story was designed specifically for audio consumption. And I've always enjoyed taking things in through the ears, you know, um, audio books, uh, old plays. You know, I listen to old radio and stuff like that. 
But do you think that podcasting has sort of revitalized long form journalism and given like an independent journalist the ability to go, all right, I'm going to create this. I don't have gatekeepers. I'm going to make this and put it out into the world. Also, and after that, real quick, how does something like this get pushed out and become so popular so quickly? Well, as for the um, the long form question, yeah, certainly for me and a lot of the long form journalists that I know uh, when I moved to Atlanta, Sort of all the long form journalists, and we're all doing magazine stories. We're all aiming to do, you know, New Yorker style narrative features, and we all did it. Um, and it was it was great. Um, but it, it, opportunities seem to dwindle as magazines close. Um, the pay pay got less, and at the same time, podcasts came in and sort of like gave us another opportunity to do these kind of things. So a lot of my friends are doing these kind of. Um, you know, six or eight episode limited series. Um, so yeah, it's definitely given opportunity to some people. I, I, it seems like the business overall has gotten a little harder, um, even with podcasts. Um, and podcasts seem to have hit their peak in terms of like how many are being made <laughs> okay. or how much on a budget. Um, and I, I, I don't really know that much about the business, but I know that everyone tells me that's harder to sell a podcast these days. And this one, this one took, I think I wrote the pitch, um, at least eight or nine months before it sold. I thought it was completely not going to happen. Like I, I was, I considered it dead. The um, the story, and then one day I got a call from Campside saying, uh, "I think we can look. We found a partner, Waveland." Did you uh, have it complete already, or did they give you like some funding to go out and do it? I'd probably done about three percent of the work, so no, nothing. There was a, maybe two or three interviews recorded at that point, or two or three different people that I'd recorded. And I'm not even sure if we use those in the end. I think we had to redo everything. Um, but then once um, we sort of had a contract uh, and I had a producer, which is my really good friend, Johnny Kaufman, who really is like, uh, uh, you know, an equal partner in, in this podcast. We did everything together every single step of the way, including the writing, the editing, the interviews. Um, he also is an audio expert. So he did, just did so much. Um, uh yeah, it was there was just like so much work to do once once we got the contract. Most of it was was happened after that. The vast majority. Is, is it like the way it used to be when you have a story and you pitch it to a podcast company? Do they give you funding to go out and do it like the like a magazine would do to write an article for them? Yeah, or very similar. Also? Okay. Yeah, okay. It's definitely similar. Um, we, you know, I, I get a fee, sort of standard fee, just like I would for a magazine. You know, versus like a you know per word fee or something like that. Um, and then there was a budget. I, I don't actually know what the the budget was like, you know, for travel and documents. And, you know, if we have to eat meals on the road and we didn't, we didn't take a single plane ride for this podcast because everything was in Georgia. Um, mm. but we didn't spend too much, but yeah, it was, it's pretty similar. Um, I definitely, right. I've had magazine articles where I spent more money, um, <laughs> than I did for this eight episode, you know, book length series. Um, uh, it was, it was relatively inexpensive, uh, you know, budget wise, uh, like on, like on my end, like the travel expenses budget and stuff like that. Cool. I'm glad to hear that because you deserve to get paid. So that's that's good. Oh, thanks. <laughs> so what if this gets optioned and it goes to uh, the big I hope, screen? I hope it does. And I'd, you know, I'd love to be involved if it does. Um, and that's maybe a better question for the producers, the uh, the high up producers. You had history with you know, the journalism and doing a podcast once before. Did you have any trouble when it came to the performance because you, you have a, a great voice. And I was wondering, was that an easy take or was that a lot of multiple takes? Um, it was extremely hard. Um, I had I'd done one series before this and I did one a two part episode that I hosted of, of another show, just like within, you know, a, a longer show. And I just wasn't confident at all in my voice. Um, and I have no acting background, no radio background or anything. So, and so again, my producer, Johnny Coffin, who has a really strong background on radio and radio, um, just coached me through basically every single word. And there were a lot of times where I just said, can you say it? And then I'll just copy you. Um, and I, like, I just, I, it, it was a sh real struggle. Um, but I'm like pretty proud that I got through it without, without, I don't know hurting myself <laughs> that episode two episode two at the beginning um you know i recommended this podcast to my boss and today i saw him in the hallway he goes hey, i'm halfway through that podcast you recommend he goes that's huh, gross <laughs> well they do give you a warning <laughs> and he's did a doctor you write... isn't he <laughs> isn't he a doctor yes he's a doctor <laughs> yes. so um episode two that beginning when you're describing what happens to the body after death you guys i guess wrote that together yeah, yeah. Johnny and I wrote everything together. Yeah, that was like wow. 
I mean, it really was. It, it blew me away. And you're just like Dustin was saying. I mean, just the way that you say it, you really, I don't know, man, you're really good at this. I think I think it's your gift. Yeah. Thank you. Other Thank than writing. <laughs> yeah. Hope, I mean, I think if you listen to the podcast and then listen to this interview, you'll see that I slow down quite a bit during the narration. I'm more of a, a mumbler and a a side talker, a caveat speaker um, in real life. Um, but I, luckily, I get many takes, and I had many takes at times. I also got sick during one episode. I won't say which. And I, I can hear, like, a difference in my voice. Um, I think I had a cold or something, and I can I can hear, like, the difference there. Um, I don't know if they did something with the sound or something to make that go away, but I can still hear it. Only you hear that, because I've done a million podcasts with uh, stuffed up nose, and I'm like, I suck, I suck, I suck, and then... <laughs> Nobody knows. Nobody. Um, we do. Yeah. When you hear it in your headphones, you're like, oh, yeah, I'm stuffed up. Um, and a lot of people helped. And Johnny was there for every step. But there was also a great sound engineer um, in the studio um, with an amazing composer who I already mentioned, um, who we would also like listen in. Um, another like uh, editor on staff who, uh, who would just just give her, give her opinion as well. It was just like amazing. So many people like giving me direction. And I have to ask this question. It's from one of our long-term listeners, uh, Amber Gilpatrick. She's been with us from like the beginning, and she is a cr- true crime freak. So she said she was obsessed with this case, and uh, she poured over the actual crime scene photos back in 2002. And um, she wanted to know if you saw any of these photos, because her sick ass has been trying to find them ever since she can't find them online anymore. <laughs> Um, well, I don't. I don't think I want to say how I got them. Not because there was anything wrong with it, but because I don't want to encourage people to get them because they're they're personal. Um, gotcha. Yes, I've I've looked at all. I, I don't know how many, but hundreds, if not thousands, of photos of the property. You know, from various agencies and court documents, stuff like that. Um, and it was not pleasant, but it, it was just necessary for fact checking reasons um, and for storytelling reasons. And I've never shown them to another person i don't plan to um because they have have real people in them you can see faces oh you can can see what i describe in the podcast which is every state of decomposition or not and every there is no like photo of a human body in this case that i think is not disturbing they're all like really disturbing um all the things described are in photos as well and uh but i you know i vowed for sure like i was never going to show them to anyone all the law enforcement people who talked about them with me said, you know, don't, don't show them, you know, to people just cause you know, involves real human beings. Right. Sorry, well, Amber, you'll just have to live with your memories. <laughs> Sorry, yes. Amber. Yeah, my bad. We're good, <laughs> get a time machine. Yeah. And, and to, to talk about what ends up happening would spoil the podcast. And I don't want to do that for people who uh, don't remember the case like me. I don't remember it. I'm, I'm not Googling it because I'm enjoying the podcast too much. And yeah. Not from like, a, oh, this is such fun, but it's just so compelling. And uh, it really it really grabs you in and and pulls you in, you know. And I could see this being a, a television series or a movie or something on Netflix like that. I, I think it definitely has that kind of kind of legs. And, and, you know, to juxtapose that with something like the Tiger King or making a murderer, those things are so sensational and point you in a direction and they want you to believe one thing is true, even though it might not be. I think with this, it's just straight up journalism, but also has humanity involved because of all the different people that you've brought in that are still around. We really tried to be like as respectful as we could to everyone involved. Um, And I kept on saying that my goal was for everyone Everyone who listens to this, who was involved in the case from any side of it, I want them all to be happy. Um, like there's, there's no person we went out of our way to make look bad. We tried to make everyone look good. Um, cause I, I mean, I think most people are good. Um, everyone, even everyone involved in this story. I was telling somebody the uh, the story about uh, McCracken talking about how he was trying to get the venue changed and that the, <laughs> that he went. <laughs> he's like, I'm going to get this guy riled up. Oh, well, he can't do it. He's sick. <laughs> I'm like, OK, well, I, I guess. Uh, yeah. So I'm, I'm I'm doing word of mouth stuff. Um, I'm on the radio here in Atlanta, too, on, on WSB, um, which is a news station. And uh, I'm trying to get everybody here to give it a shot. And plus, my wife is a journalist, so I'm just like, you got to listen to this. She listens to a lot of true crime, so I'm sure it's in her queue now. Thanks for spreading the word. I feel like it, it needs every listener and hope, hopefully all the ones who enjoy it, you know, tell someone else just like you are. Um, and I do think uh, 
I do think the second half of the series, I guess the second half started today. Um, like the last three episodes, or even the last two in particular, are the best ones. Those are the ones I feel like most proud of. Um, and I think it's it would be sort of worth worth waiting to get there. But you got me today. The the one today with the the two funeral home guys, the ones that were at nine eleven, and they travel all over the world, basically doing the cleanup and stuff and helping them. Ah. I was crying. I mean, I'm at work. I got my little earbud in. I'm like, oh my God, this is something else. Those guys were amazing. I, I think I say in the in episode, it's not a spoiler that, um, you know, they should have their own show, um, whether it's fictional or true. They're just, they have such amazing stories, such incredible banter and such history together. Um, I, we didn't even get a chance to mention how they met, which was in the, um, the floods in Albany, which was, uh, I think, I think around 2000, there was a giant flood in Albany and um albany georgia excuse me and uh hundreds of caskets came out of the ground uh because the flooding was so intense and they needed people to come and identify all these bodies and one of them one of these two morticians happened to live in albany um and i think he had a funeral home there and so he volunteered and this other guy came from columbus and volunteered and they became best friends and they started working together um it was such an amazing story but we, there were so many stories like that we couldn't even include in the podcast no. And Dustin was there, weren't you, Dustin? Yeah, we. I was working with a service master, and we had the contract to clean up the U-Haul trucks that they moved the majority of bodies out with. So, oh. that, so we had uh, we had to de- decontaminate them, and so yeah, it's it's neat that this story happens because it it affected so many people in this area in different. Um, you know, I worked in a disaster restoration company. I heard about it on the news, saw all the stuff. And then one day we're driving up and I'm like, why do we have all these ozones? Why, why, why do we have all this decontamination equipment? And they're like, yeah, we're going to go decontaminate some trucks. And sure enough, we pull into a place and, you know, uh, seeing all these pictures and talking about it, like you're saying is one thing, but the smell is something that you never, ever forget. And it's very, very very particular smell you um you can't really describe it yeah i i, well, I spoke with um the gbi agent greg ramey in, in the podcast about that and it was very vivid the way he described it i i don't think i've ever smelled human death myself i'm, I'm not sure i really want to um but he, he said it was different than than animals i don't know if you've experienced that yeah. as well yeah yeah that's the line he used yeah he said it was different than animals and it is far worse um, I had a, a neighbor who uh, died below me in an old apartment years ago, and uh, they didn't find his body for three or four days, and uh, they had to completely decam- de- decontaminate the building because it, you know, it just, you put a candle in there and it just smelled like death candle. Didn't matter what scent yeah. it was. It was not very pleasant. But you would know even better than me, Dustin, using... Yeah, we, well, we did trauma cleanup. So, yeah, we did a lot of cleanup in, in that respect. And that's why, you know, they were con- we were contracted for cleaning out the trucks. But, um, yeah, it's it's not something – it's something that you – this job and any any part of it, you have to separate yourself and, and, and de- you know, compartmentalize things in order to be able to just do your job. And that was part of the reason why I got out of it too. It's, it's uh, after a certain point and I had children, it just doesn't – I would rather not have that in the back of my mind every day now. Yeah. yeah, I guess it didn't contaminate you. Um, journalism, journalism is a similar way. Sometimes you have to sort of separate yourself from the emotional side of things to, um, you know, to speak to people. Um, in this case, I was able to just sort of be a normal human being when interviewing people, which makes it easier usually. Yeah, was it hard to get them to trust you? Yeah. Oh, sorry. Was it hard to get them to trust us? Yeah, I think I think every single person in this story was skeptical, um, you know, before they met us, but. I think I think it's safe to I think it, I can honestly say that Johnny and I are pretty normal people and did really like sympathize with everyone who we were interviewing and hopefully that came out when we were talking to them. Um, a few people who talked to us who really were doing it despite not wanting to um, for various reasons, which I think may come out in, like later episodes. Um, but I felt like. I could be buddies with everyone that we talked to by the end of it. And I, I don't know if they would say the same, but it felt that way. You know. Have you heard from any of them since the podcast has been airing? Yeah, I've heard from a few, uh, The pe- particularly the people who have already appeared. And there are, I think there are some people who haven't appeared yet and haven't heard from them. But yeah, I've gotten, 
uh, I don't want to brag, but it's been like kind of universal praise so far. Maybe I just <laughs> you know, some people who are happy and not from the people who are upset. Uh, I'm sure there will be some upset people by the end, um, but it certainly wasn't our aim. And I don't, I don't think it would be because we've been unfair to anyone. That's my, my opinion anyway. Am I the only idiot that thought when you were cremated that it burned everything? Your no, I thought that. Oh, same. I thought that too, for sure. I knew just as little as anybody else. Um, and I, I think the vast majority of people think it's, you know, uh, you know, like blowing, uh, blowing dust in the wind that is, or like, like, like the big Lebowski scene. That's what people yeah. picture. Dude, sure. I was just thinking of that scene. And I thought about it earlier today when the guy's talking about it doesn't just blow in the wind like dust. It just, yeah, cause that's what you see in movies. And that's, that's where we learn stuff, you know, from TV yeah. and movies. Yep. Uh, yeah, that's, that's as little, I, I do nothing. I do nothing at all. The GBI agent, uh, Greg Ramey, did he also play the sheriff in Kill Bill, Planet Terror, and from Dust Bowl yeah. Dawn? That's him. That's him. Yeah, that's him for sure. Uh, <laughs> wait, about the actor, uh, what's his name? Uh, he, he does remind me of him. Michael he's, Parks. He's, Michael Parks, yeah. Sim- similar uh, feel, but uh, Greg's got some real real warmth in him, too. He's he's a real, real caring guy, too. Meeting Greg was really lucky. I think it was lucky that he had retired a few years earlier before we spoke with him. Because he probably wouldn't have been able to speak quite so freely if he was, you know, still working for GBI, and, and there, that was the case with a few people. You know, they were sort of out of whatever business we were interviewing interviewing them about, and so they could speak just like you know with uh, honest reflection. Well, there are currently uh, five episodes available. Three more on the way. You can find it on Spotify, iTunes, I guess, in any of your favorite podcatchers, um, and uh, they're they're. You know, they don't take a huge chunk of your time, but you don't even they're so good. You don't even notice that like it. you'll start it and then, oh, it's over already. I want more. Yeah, my coworker today, she was like, I wish they were longer. I'm, I'm <laughs> mad. I'm mad when it's over. I'm like, no, yeah. three more episodes. And then we're going to have to wait uh, until your next podcast. But uh, you do other work as well. We want you to to share what you do. And, and uh, you're, if you have social media and stuff like that, please share it. Yeah, my uh, my. X or Twitter account is just my name at Sean Revive, S H A U N R A V I V. My website is just Sean Uh, I'm not on social media all that much. Um, I, I write for some other podcasts. I write for a, a, fic- a horror fiction podcast called run fool, um, which I think is pretty popular. It's like a sort of urban legends, um, dramatized, um, uh, hosted by, um, a great TV writer named, uh, Rodney Barnes. Um, and, uh, and then, you know, I've have lots of other gigs writing individual episodes here and there. Um, but we're I'm also hoping to do another podcast in time soon. I'm just waiting for the right idea. So yeah, thanks so much for having me. Thank you. Yes, man. Thank you so much. Radio Labyrinth is brought to you by Atlanta Pizza in Europe. Here's the thing about Atlanta Pizza in Euro. It's not in Atlanta, but they call it Atlanta Pizza in Euro. It's in Conyers. Why don't they call it CPG? I don't know. It tastes really good. I don't care. Meanwhile, over in Conyers, they have proudly been serving the East Metro Atlanta area for over 40 years. That's a lot of pizza and euros. By the way, is it Euro or Gyro? Atlanta Pizza in Gyro is the place to be all summer long. They have over 16 ice-cold craft beers and ciders. What's wrong with just drinking cider out of a plastic jug in October like you're supposed to? No, you can drink it all the time, especially at Atlanta Pizza in Euro. Many others are also available in bottles and cans. Look, they have the best gyros, pizzas, hot subs, and Greek and Italian specialties around. Okay, stop by Monday through Friday from 11 to 9 p.m. and Saturday from 12 to 9 p.m. They're closed on Sundays. Why don't they close on Saturday? On Tuesday nights, they have team trivia from 7 to 8.30 p.m. Bring your smartest friends and test your trivia knowledge, okay, against the best Conyers has to offer, like Dustin. They also have a food truck. Contact Mike at 770-483-6228. For more details or to schedule an event. He also says, thank you for listening to the best podcast around and for all your business and continued support. Hey, do you have a commercial or residential construction printing need? Well, what are you waiting for? 
contact LDI Repro Printing of Athens. They've been in Athens since 2005 with fast turnaround and affordable prices. Call 706-316-9366 or email them at Athens at LDILine.com. And we're back. Yeah, we are back. And uh, thank you very much to our guest, Sean Raviv. What a what a great podcast. Everybody go out and listen to that podcast if you're not uh, listening to it presently. There are three new episodes left, and uh, you can just start, spend an hour or two uh, diving in. The Noble. And to Noble is the name of the podcast. Yeah, thank you, Steph. It's news, trailers, and trends with Steph. You better read that fine print. Uh, whenever you agree to a streaming service, because <laughs> if you're linked up with Disney, they put a clause in there that you can't sue them. So yeah. if your wife dies at the theme park because she has a food allergy and uh, you try to sue them, well, you wrote that right away whenever you subscribe to Disney Plus. Yeah, that's such bullshit. You don't when you sign up for Disney Plus, it doesn't say anywhere in there that if you die of food poisoning or anaphylaxis at their park because you've told them several times uh so and so has a nut allergy and you ask several times and they tell you no there's no nuts in this but it's contaminated and you die of anaphylaxis well i think disney's going to have to pony up i think they can afford it don't you i think well they can they, can, they can and uh, the thing is is that they can only go to arbitration so when you okay. sign that shit with disney plus you're stating that i cannot sue Disney or anything. There's two things that they you can sue them for, which I did not see it listed what the hell the two things were. But there's like two things. But everything else, when you sign up for Disney Plus, you are agreeing to only go to arbitration with them over something. That, How know. does that work if you sign up for a streaming service, but you're at their park and, and you know, Mickey Mouse, you know, stabs you? Yeah, I, I canceled Disney Plus and and when I went to Disney yesterday, Mickey Mickey pistol whipped me. Can I sue him? Yeah. <laughs> Are you all right, by the way? <laughs> I'm okay now. Damn right. Well, they try to wiggle out of it by, because the restaurant considers Disney a landlord, that they're not a Disney restaurant. They're just a restaurant on Disney's property. Uh-huh. So, so di- that works out to Disney's favor because they could bankrupt the restaurant and then uh, kick them out and put a new place in there. I can't imagine well, if any good anyway. Well, it sounds like, I mean, considering, like you said, they did say it like 10 times. My my wife will die if she eats nuts and dairy. And they were like, no. And that's what they were famous for. That restaurant was for, or Disney in general is supposed to be, uh, they cater to people with food allergens. Apparently not. It's also Disney's been notorious for people not dying in their parks, but dying. Yeah, they'll the like take them in a wheelbarrow and dump, dump <laughs> no. them out somewhere. No, they will. They will. Orlando. You will have a heart attack in the park. They will call an ambulance. And then even if you've died, they won't declare you dead until you get off the property. Until you yeah. get to the I back think Ron the DeSantis. Until you get to Orlando DeSantis General. Do something about that. Right? Ron DeSantis. He, he should. That. You would think. But yeah, well, that one lady, in, in, and it's in both parks, all over, the, you know, in, in uh, L.A., that one lady that was decapitated, and they said that she didn't die in the park. She died at the hospital. She was decapitated. She was decapitated. She was alive, and they, well, they put her head on, on top. Yeah, the, the head was on ice until they got to the yeah. hospital. Yeah, I they, can't they wait used, to get to the hospital. They used Walt's bucket. They just threw it. <laughs> yeah. Well, they, they were going to Futurama her head, and yeah. then they realized they couldn't. So, they couldn't. Yep, she's dead. Sorry. You know DeSantis is in that mouse's pocket. Oh, yeah. One way or the other. I don't do any more gay stuff. Uh Uh-huh. Speaking speaking of Disney, I know Tim is devastated. They have canceled the Acolyte after one season. That's too bad. I blame Tim. I had nothing to do with it. I didn't lead to any charge. That's why I blame you. Wow. You don't have to watch it. Other people watched it twice. You know, they, they took Star Wars and they said, let's do this. And most of the Star Wars fan population said, eh, eh, we want Mandalorian. Um, it was a bold effort. But rest in peace to the Acolyte. Um, <clears throat> speaking of rest in peace, uh, back from the grave is Beetlejuice coming at the very beginning of September. I think it's September 3rd or 6th or 6th, something like or that. Maybe I can't remember. 
Beetlejuice, Damn. Beetlejuice is coming out. And uh, the, Michael Keaton recently talked about reprising his role as the title character. And he said that he had two stipulations. One, he did not want to be on screen for a long time because the original Beetlejuice was not the main focus. Mm-hmm. So he's got about the same amount of runtime as he did in the first one, which was like 15 minutes. And we never even realized it. Yeah, it 17, 17 minutes is the, all he's in the first Beetlejuice. Wow. And it's, that's crazy. And I never even realized that either. And also that they did not make uh, Beetlejuice like politically correct and updated. He's just as scummy as he always was. <laughs> Good. So I definitely look forward to that, that they're going to keep him very classically disgusting. Save that one for later. <laughs> what is Chick-fil-A getting into the streaming service game? I saw the story today that they're they're going to do is they have they're going to have a streaming app and they're going to do reality, but they're also going to do scripted shows. So that's interesting. I, I wonder what it'll be. Do you think think it'll be like family friendly type of stuff? Yeah, yeah. I think it's going to be all family friendly, religious, for sure. religious backed. Yeah, tons, you think tons, tons of no gay shows content. on Sunday though. Tons, tons of, of what? Gay, yeah. con- gay content. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure there'd be a lot of that in there. That's um, what they're all, all about. Took, if you remember, all it took was the, I guess, all it took for him to realize that it was a possibility was the sauce girl that happened a couple yeah. months ago. Like, man, oh. she blew up and got her whole she career. She did, and now she's, where is she now, though? She's, college. Yeah, she's in college, but she's also a huge, she's got a huge um, following. I mean, it bumped her up to the millions. Yeah. Well, just like Hawk Tua girl, Haley Welch. I got to give it to Haley Welch, though. She's not, like, degenerate. She's just going around having fun, getting all these free trips, meeting all these famous people. And by degenerate, I just mean she was kind of drunk, and she's not that... She just came out and said something stupid and was being funny, and it blew up for her. So I'm happy for her. Good for her. Yeah, my last story, this is like a... It's just something... Ah, this actor, he's a French actor named Elaine Dillion. Have you ever heard of him? Elaine mm-hmm. Delon. Mm-hmm. He, I guess he's a big deal over there, but he's 88. He was a big animal lover, and he had requested that if he died prior to his dog, that he wanted his dog euthanized as well to be buried with him. Mm-hmm. And his After he died, his family were like, mm-mm, we're not doing it. Why not? not? Let the, let the dog life and then bury him with them yeah. when he, after he dies. That's what I'm saying. I just don't understand why he wanted the dog killed to be with him if there's nothing wrong with the dog. Well, the family, they've they've been getting like a, a lot of back and forth from people. Some people were like, oh, you really need to honor his wishes. And the other people are like, oh, thank God you're not psychotic. Thank God you're not honoring his wishes. <laughs> exactly. I don't know. That's why I wanted to ask you guys what you thought about that. Um, if the dog's still alive and healthy, don't do that. You know, my, when my grandmother died there, she still had a dog, uh, that I'd given her, uh, in 1988. And so this was 11 years later and the dog had uh, all sorts of, it was one of those inbred cocker spaniels. So it had dan- really bad skin problems and, and earwax and stuff, you know, stink, yeah. but I was going to take the dog back. And when I got up there, uh, my uncle was like, ah, now we put it to sleep. I'm like, oh, so I don't know. I can see his point. But you, if the dog's healthy and stuff, don't kill the dog. Dog's still alive. Yeah, it's kind of selfish, wouldn't you think? I, I was wondering when he wrote his will, was it even that dog that he was talking about? It was right. this dog. Oh, okay. He said that this was his end of life dog. Mm-hmm. Um, when he, Yeah, whenever he got this dog, it was a Belgian Malinois. And oh. um, he had already said that, like, he didn't it didn't matter like if he was dying first he wanted the dog euthanized and well with him but yeah it is very strange especially since he's such an animal lover it just seems so bizarre to me that he'd be like kill my dog and put him in my casket anyway that's all my news guys are you reading the online comments Got to read some of these comments. I'm loving your guys' comments. You're reading your own comments? Yeah, they're really good. I worked hard on them. The secret is don't read the comment cards. All right, you guys want to read some uh, YouTube comments? Sure. Fuxi says, just trying to get Steph involved in the fish conversation was hilarious. And by the way, 13th Warrior and the book it's based on are both great. Uh, Velma, the, uh, Velma the Id says, I agree Hot Rod was an excellent movie. I still need to watch it. So you got to watch Hot Rod, man. You got to. 
got to be on my list. Uh, uh, Roby says 13th Warrior is also a retelling of Beowulf. Is that how you say it? Beowulf? Beowulf, yeah. Beowulf, yeah. Uh, New 206 says the long, the running gag in Lone Ranger where Depp fed the bird on his hat got me. I don't remember that. Yeah, he's if you look at him on the picture, he's got like a stuffed crow as part yeah. of his hat, and he's constantly throughout the movie like feeding it. Yeah, it's a good mm-hmm. gag. Uh, Hemp Huntress 7970, who is our friend Angel, said a couple of comments. I want to read them first one. Proud to be a little sister of that paternity. She's talking about the paternity that I was in with my buddies who I went to fish with before little sisters got canceled. Some of the best memories are when we were all weirdos in old houses with beer sticky floors, loud music and thinking we were cool. Uh, and there was always that one room in those houses that was hazy and lit with blue lights. And I, you know, you're talking about it. <laughs> uh, and she also said fish heads and dead heads. You either get it or you don't, Steph. I love Steph's commentary. <laughs> Thank you. I thought him Huntress was Beth. Yeah, it is. Her, her, yeah, angel, we call her, angel. her nickname. Oh, okay. I was I was like, what the hell? I've been talking to somebody else this whole time. I didn't even know it. <laughs> no, her name <laughs> is Beth. Right. Yeah, that's Beth, but we've we've always called her Angel since what in eighty nine. Why yeah. do you call her Angel? That was that's her, just name. her name when she came to college. Oh, that is her real name. No, her that was her like her, her real name is Beth, but her nickname was Angel. All right, damn it, Beth! Why do they call you Angel? Where where would this come from? Hey, she she saved my brain one night. I'll tell that story someday. Um, it was involving the Grateful Dead, LSD, and Albany, New York. Mm-hmm. All right. Uh, Terry says, Terry Fuller says, Vince Vaughn really went from a 10 to straight saddlebag. <laughs> yeah, they got him looking pretty decent in, in, in Bad Monkey, I'd say. It's Thank not you. for you to say, Jeff. It's for us to say. Oh, okay. I mean, did you used to, like, you know, fantasize about Vince Vaughn? Maybe yes. you did. I used to hear him in his room at night when we lived. <laughs> you're so money. You're so money. You're so some money. money. Baby. Yeah. I'll give you some money. <laughs> uh, and our last one comes. Oh, what book ends with Foopsie. John Carter was so bad that Disney didn't even make toys based on the film. I love Edgar Rice Burroughs stories, but I think the problem with this movie is the lack of chemistry between Taylor Kitsch and Lynn Collins. Just a waste. Thank you for your comments. You can always leave comments under here, uh, under your uh, your YouTube video. You know, just leave comments and we'll read them just like that, even if they're mean. No. But we love it. You guys are really stepping up. These are great comments, and, and keep them coming. We, we we like them. Say this, that we are doing uh, some news stories that we didn't get to because they're a little spicy. And uh, we're going to do views or snooze and staff picks over on the Patreon show and whatever else comes to mind. I want to thank Sean Revee for coming on the show. Steph got him on. Uh, good job booking that. Everybody check out the podcast Noble about the Tri-State Crematorium and the uh, the Marsh family. Um, I'm excited for the ending because I don't remember what happened, and I'm not going to, you know, spoil it by Googling it. Uh, but uh, check out Sean Revive again at SeanRevive.com. And again, the podcast is available wherever you find podcasts. Uh, I do a show every Monday in the audio feed of Radio Lambreth called uh, Trambles, and this most recent episode was uh, an old radio tale from... I guess 2001, uh, when I did a, um, I used to do a series of events at American Pie called What Would You Do for $1,000? And this was one Friday night uh, that I'm recollecting that uh, some people did some very, very gross things. And uh, they did not win. Uh, but the guy who won did an even grosser thing. You'll just have to listen to your <laughs> <laughs> the the show I do every Saturday on WSB Radio is called The Popcast. It's a pop culture show. Um, this week... Oh, but last week my guest was Brian Bates, and he is on the uh, the Nate Land podcast with Dusty Slay, Aaron Weber, and of course Nate Bargatze. He's in town. If you're listening to this and you're in Atlanta on the 24th, he's in town tonight, and uh, you can find out all that information from the the show notes of that, or, or just go to his website, BrianBatesComedy.com. He was a real nice guy, and I really enjoyed that interview, and uh, I made him laugh once when I was doing a Dusty impression. Hmm. Uh-huh. But he's a cool dude, so go check him out. This week is uh, Dragon Con preview with Dan Carroll, who uh, I think this is his last year doing um, any press for for Dragon Con. I believe he'll still be a volunteer, but we had a great conversation. He made it in, and I was very happy to see him. Uh, And so we talk about a lot of stuff. And then I'm going to be on hiatus for a couple of weeks because... uh, 
Go dogs! It's time for Georgia football. So it may, you know, if I get the inkling, I'll do a, a podcast. Uh, let's thank our Patreon members. You can go to patreon.com forward slash Tim Andrews and sign up uh, for Patreon. And uh, that's how you get access to the uh, to the pop uh, to the Patreon only show. And if you come in as a producer, which is the twenty five dollar level, then you get a T shirt from our T shirt store, and uh, you can get a printout or something, a drawing uh, that I've done. So um, that's at any level, and you can become a producer. When you're a producer at the twenty five dollar a month level, you get a shout out every week because you're producing this show. And uh, I want to thank John Allen, Matt Carter, Chris Chandler, Mike D, uh, Jim Fortner, Terry Fuller, Roby Neely, Jeff Peterson, Tim Slayton, Brian, and Chelsea Smith. So thank you guys very, very much. And thank you to all the Patreon members. Remember, if you're listening or watching on YouTube, to like and subscribe, share it with your friends, and always comment. Turn on the uh, notifications so you know when a new episode comes out. And uh, as always, Dustin does a kick-ass job turning it into an actual show with clips and, and drops and fun stuff. And that's uh, that's what makes it a lot of fun. And you can hear all that as well, but it's better to look at it, right? Plus, you get to look at uh, me and Jeff. <laughs> all right. Um, anything else, guys? Otherwise, we're going to head on over and do the... Uh, we need to come up with a name for this show. So if, you have, if you're a listener or a viewer and you have an idea for the name of our uh, Patreon show, don't call it Doozy After Doozy. That's already taken, and we're not going to do that because we're not going to you know, smoke Gainabus. Uh, but, uh, well, not uh, speaking for myself. Call, when do we call Great. it the, gr- the gross part? <laughs> Just call it the gross part? Yeah. Radio Labyrinth, off, off the off, air. Off the, uh, yeah, after, after dark. Radio Labyrinth, well, that's taken all right, guys, we'll talk to you next week. Uh, stick around because, well, or wait, uh, yeah, whatever. Keep it cannon. Keep it cannon. Keep it cannon. Well, when you say all good things come to an end, what's that got to do with this show? Oh. Lost in the radio, my friend.